Greetings everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are back for the Memories of Plymouth. It has been a most, my eyes are rolling right now, a most unusual year. We typically run from April to September and of course this year because of COVID we did not start till September. It is December 21st, 2020 today and today's our last interview. Uh, let me introduce myself if I can. I'm Louise McCormick from the Plymouth Historical Society and we've been running this program for four years. We truly believe the stories, the memories, the reflections that we've been sharing are part of this community. And whenever I say community, I'm talking about Plymouth and the local towns that surround us. We're very fortunate today. We have, am I going to call you a repeater? I think I am. <laughs> Barbara was here in September, October, and we were fascinated by a few of the comments that she had on BB River and the corporation, her life there, that we've asked her to come again. And today we're focusing specifically on BB River, the Draper Corporation, how it got started, and especially what life was then. Without further ado, you can see our, all our memorabilia here. I'd like to introduce you to Barbara Corsi Courier. And typically, I would shake your hand. <laughs> We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. So thank you, Barbara, for coming back. Thank you for having me. Oh, I was delightful the first time, and I'm looking forward to the second time right now. So let's begin. The audience may not um, have seen your first one, so we're going to just spend a minute or two, if we can, about you and your family. If you can share the names of maybe your mom, mom and dad, mother and father. Okay, I'm going to start with my grandparents because that's what brought us into, brought my family into okay. BB River. Uh, my grandfather, who I never got to know, uh, and my grandmother, whose name was Martha Leach, uh, came from uh, Vermont, up in Waterville, Vermont. And they brought their daughter, who, Barbara, who had polio at a time when there was not a polio uh, cure for it. And when they got into BB River, they just got contact with my mother and father, who was Clarence and Nettie Corsi. And um, they, my mother and father had two children at that time, my older brother Charles and my sister Peggy, or Frances, called Peggy. Uh, they followed my grandparents into BB River. And my two siblings who were older were born in Vermont, but my brother Earl and myself were born in New Hampshire. But I was the only one that was born in a hospital because of my mother's age. She was 42 at the time, and that was very dangerous for a woman in those times to have a child. So that's how they came to BB, and that's how they brought me to BB uh, after that. The hospital that you were born in? It was the old hospital, which is up near Livermore Falls, and uh, it was quite a nice hospital for the age because it was a really good size hospital. Nice. Dr. Middleton and Dr. DeWitt were there at the time, and there was a doctor from Campton. I can't remember his last name now. And you have children? I do have children. I have four children. I have three boys and a girl. My oldest son, Richard, uh, went to Germany and married a German girl, so I have two grandchildren in Germany. And my son, Randy, and Karen Dearborn Courier have a large family that live on the same road as I do. My younger son lives in uh, Thornton, and uh, <coughs> my daughter lives in Wolfboro. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Thank you for doing that. We're going to talk about history of BB River. And as you said before, you pretty much were born there. You were brought up there. Oh, you yes. were educated there, and I could go on and on. And the terminology term I use is a self-contained community. Is that fair? It was a model community for the time, okay. and it was very self-contained. It had uh, administrative offices. It had a nurse's office. They had an office for the railroad people, and the general store had a post office in it. There were 25 or 26 houses in that community at the time. Plus, there was uh, a boarding house that seated 200 people, and attached to the boarding house was uh, four apartments, one of which my grandmother lived in. Very nice, everything was very nice in BB River. And then there was a playground for the children, and there was uh, a building called the Beehive. 
And that, I think, probably was called a beehive, and I don't know, but I think it was because there were so many people that lived in it, and so many people worked out of that, uh, out of their homes there. And uh, that was just a section of BB River. Wow, wow. Um, can you kind of, for the audience, tell me exactly where BB River is located? Okay, BB River is uh, uh, part of Campton, New Hampshire. And it's, um, Campton still has taxes to people in BB, uh, the homes in BB River and the land. And uh, if you came up from Plymouth up 175, it'd probably follow it maybe five or six miles and then it's at the top of a long hill you'll see a sign that says BB River. If you came up 93 and crossed over on 49, picked up 175 at the dam, then you'd go down that way, and it's probably four or five miles. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. The company itself, Draper, when did they arrive, approximately? Yeah. Actually, they came and uh, bought the property in 1925, and they established the mill. They spent $500,000 to establish the mill to their specifications, and uh, they, uh, in 1926, they actually started work in the mill. Mm -hmm. uh, so it took them almost a year to get set up the way they wanted to be to have the, the mill in working order. And their advertisements were that they could employ 350 people and they advertised for men, which over the years was pretty interesting because by the time um, I left BB River, there was many, many women that worked in the mill as well, but the early advertisements were just for men. Prior to 1925, what was there, if anything? There was a small sawmill operation that was part of the Parker Young Lumber Industry, okay. and uh, it's my understanding that the Parker Young bought 22,000 acres. And that's what brought Draper into that area, because Draper needed to find uh, a place where there was hardwood, especially maple, and uh, they also needed to be near a railroad, which BB River had its own railroad, and the railroad was 26 miles long, and it went from BB River up into the Sandwich Notch area, and they also went from BB River to the Lincoln area. So, you know, <clears throat> if they had the forest and they had uh, the railroad, then they needed the housing for the people who were going to live there. So that's when that community started to expand. Hmm. Amazing. Amazing. Um, I'm not sure. Where did they come from? I lost it. Blame it on me. Where did Draper come from? What was, where uh, were, what was their uh, original Hol location? Holyoke, Massachusetts. Okay. And they not only uh, developed looms, which the bobbins uh, are run somehow in the looms. I don't understand the mechanics of it. But they were the largest uh, supplier of bobbins in the whole world. They would put out 100,000 bobbins a day. 100,000? Yeah, and each bobbin, as I understand it, took 35 steps to make it the way it should be to be put out for purchase. Uh, for the audience, could we see what a bobbin looks oh, like? Oh, sure. This was be, well. This would not be the way it started. It started with truckloads of bobbin of uh, logs coming in, and they were dumped into what they called the logging pond. From there, they went on a conveyor belt into the, what they call the roughing mill. And my expertise from that point is just hearsay because I have no idea what they did in the roughing mill, except they cut the, the logs into sections, and then the sections were cut down into different blocks, yeah. and then this would be the first rough bobbin. You don't see any of the rings around it, or you don't see the insert. A little bit farther down the process, this would be where the rough product was, and you'd see three silver rings here, and there would be a copper bushing in the top. And those were to keep the heads of the bobbins from splitting when they worked in the looms. And when they finally were finished, uh, my grandmother Leach was, and my brother Earl worked in the slacking room. They were given a slack of, uh, coat of slack paint. 
that was very bright and sunshiny and probably mm -hmm. helped it work in the homes. I don't know. Hmm. So we're talking about an industry that was really part of the major textiles of the oh, day. Yes. Absolutely. And drapers actually did a lot of different things in, in Holyoke. One of the things they did was make shades for schoolhouses. And then when projectors came along, they made projectors. And then they were getting into the computer business. So it wasn't just the uh, forestry bobbin industry that drapers did, and they had a big, big complex in, in Massachusetts. Seemed like they grew with the times. I, it sounds like it, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. It does. Let's see what we have. <laughs> I'm trying to catch up both with you and what you just shared with the group. Oh, you said something to me before. You said they made their own boxes. Yes, they did, and that was part of, of the bobbin industry, that they had to be shipped, and so they would make these huge wooden boxes with covers on them that the bobbins were put into to ship to wherever they were going to ship them to. And they were, the boxes were an attractive nuisance for children because they were uh, stored on an outside, um, I don't even know what you want to call it. It was a cement complex that they stored them in at the end of the fishing, finishing mill. Mm -hmm. And uh, us kids loved to get up there and play in those empty boxes, which, of course, we were not supposed to do. But there was no OSHA at that time either. <laughs> I, I, you may not have an answer to this. Would they have been stamped, <clears throat> similar to Draper and Maynard, they would say, made in Plymouth, New Hampshire by Draper and Maynard. Would the these, boxes you mean? The boxes. I would, can only assume that they would be because they were shipped all over the world. Is there evidence of these boxes anywhere? Not that I know of. I'm sure someone might, might have one because mm -hmm. people like to store stuff in them. They were That's very right. well built. Same type of wood? Would it be been a hard wood as yes. the bobbins? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. That's an assumption on my part. Well, again, your, your past figures, you had how many people working in there in this factory? Well, they, they said they could employ 350 people. And I know during the Depression years, from what my family has told me and from what I've read in their, uh, their journals, was like my grandfather and grandmother and their daughter, in Depression times, in each house, each person would get a section of work. They, all three of them couldn't work at the same time, but Drapers was very careful to make sure that everybody that worked in the mill was represented and that every home had some money coming in. They were really a really good community. I, and that's exactly what I'm hearing from you. They seemed to care about they the did. workers that they had. As a result, the workers would have stayed. Yeah. There were many benefits from working there, I assume. Well, back then, I don't know what there were for benefits. I think I'm talking um, benefits like a community. Oh, it's yes. It's self-contained. Oh, yes. Um, apartment opportunities to rent or yeah. sell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, well, nothing was sold in BB River when Drapers was there. Okay. Uh, it was all held for the employees and their families. And there were different kinds of housing, like there were the... 25 or 26 houses that were like three bedrooms, one bathroom, and they would have, uh, have to pay like $4 a week rent. Mm -hmm. And right up until the time uh, that my mother left BB River, they, she was still paying $4 for rent. <laughs> and, and the way that went in BB River, my mother worked at BB River, and my sister worked at BB River, and my father worked at BB River, and my grandmother and my, everybody that I was related to me worked in the mill except me. Wow. I, I did not work in, in, uh, in the mill, but um, it, it was, uh, if you need an apartment, there was an apartment. Mm -hmm. You know, if you were a single person, a man, there was a boarding house that held 200 people in it. And attached to the boarding house was a, a boarding house dining room uh, where the men who didn't have cooking facilities could go for meals. and. Um, really, really good cooks that cook for the men. And that was a dream of a lot of kids, would be to go to the, bar, the, the, uh, go to the boarding house to have lunch. <laughs> and finally, my mother said I could go and have lunch. Well, I wanted to go and sit in, in the dining room with everybody, but because it was all men, a young woman could not go and sit in there, a young girl, actually. And I think my mother paid 50 cents. 
would have satisfied my curiosity. <laughs> if you and I were driving in a car and we saw the sign and we start to travel down the road mm -hmm. that leads to the corporation, yeah. what would we see? Can you describe that for us? The first thing that you would see would be back when I was a child, there was a, a working farm to the left uh, and Beverly McCormick and Bob rented it on one side and the McNeil family rented it on the other side. And then uh, after Be uh, Bob and Beverly moved out and sometime later, their daughter Jane purchased that property and made it into an absolutely gorgeous house. And of course the farm wasn't there then, but when the farm was there, there was another attractive nuisance being the barn. And we, us kids would like to go up there and there'd be a rope hanging from the loft for something and we could jump from the loft onto the rope and swing. What well, a great memory. Oh yes, and then beside that, uh, loft area, there was another small building that had a metal roof, and we could climb up on that and pick the apples. So that was the first thing anybody would see coming into BB River. And then you went down a very long hill, and on the left-hand side would be uh, big stacks of lumber, because they not only sold bobbins, they sold finished lumber. And uh, that would be another place that we'd love to go up and climb on the big tall bar tall lumber piles and run from one to the other. Uh, we didn't have much to amuse us, but we had a lot of fun doing it. And then when you went right across from those uh, board piles would be the school. And it was a two-room school. Room one, uh, one room was classes one to four. And the second was classes four to eight. And in the basement, they used to teach us square dancing and different stuff like that in, in the basement. There was a playground to the side of the school, and there was one down in the village, and there was two baseball fields in the village. Two? Why two? You know, well, one was off to the side where the kids played in the baseball, and it was um, behind where the playground was. And the other one where the men played baseball was down next to the community hall. So if you went down the road from the school and you went straight ahead, you'd find the big pond. There's two ponds. The logging pond was to the left and the other pond was to the right. And the big pond we used to uh, fish in it in the summer, chase frog, frogs and pollywogs. And uh, in the winter we'd ice skate there. Um, and the logging pond, of course, was always filled with logs. So if you went past the pond and the logging pond, uh, you'd come to the uh, roughing mill. And the roughing mill was the first building that you see when you went that back side. You, if you went along a little bit further, you'd see the three-story finish mill. Mm. And that was a brick struct structure, and there was mm. a basement and two floors. And then if you took a right at the finishing mill, would be the administration building. And the first part of the administration building would be all the bookkeeping work was done in that, all the administrative work. And then you went down that uh, building a little bit further and you'd come to the nurse's station. And uh, Nina Olette was the nurse at the time and the Olettes lived on the street called Broadway. And then beyond that, as I understand it, there was an office for the railroad people. And then mm. beyond that was the general store and the post office. And this was a two-story building, so at the top of the, this building there was, I think, four apartments. And the office manager lived in one, and the storekeepers lived in another, and I don't remember who lived in the two middle ones. But that whole complex was all contained right there. And then, if you continued past that building, and you went to the, where the pond was, that's where the houses started. And we lived in a house that was <clears throat> three uh, three houses in from the boarding house and we faced the pond. And then if you continue down, uh, actually you take a left past that last house and go to the back street which had two rows of houses. And uh, as I said, there was probably 25, 26 houses. Front street, back street, and Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> you have a logging pond. Why did the pieces of wood stay? Why are they in the pond? They told me that uh, 
and my understanding of it was if they kept the logs wet that the insects didn't get into them. So they would put them in the pond and then I don't know what period of time they stayed there, but then they would pull them out and go up a conveyor belt into the roughing mill. Wow. You said your entire family worked there except for you. Uh -huh. Did you work anywhere on, in, within the complex? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. My very first job was working in the store, in the general store. And I dreamed of working in the post office, but uh, Mrs. Taj and uh, Saul and Lillian Taj and love kids. And I was young enough that I had to get a work permit or I couldn't even work. Okay. And I probably was 12 or 14 years old, I don't remember. <clears throat> hmm. But um, my job basically was, was dusting and stocking shelves and that type thing. And when they finally let me run the cash register, I was in glory. <laughs> uh huh. I can see you now. <laughs> I can see you now. That's interesting. <laughs> you mentioned you went to school there. Two identical schools were built by the Draper Corporation. Yes, they were. They built the one in Beebe River, and they built the identical one up in Cam Upper Campton Village, which is still there, and it's right beside the store. If you went past where the dam was and went up to Upper Campton Village itself, you'd see that that school was set back mm -hmm. from the road a little bit right before the store. Mm -hmm. Teachers in both, one of the same or two separate teachers? Two, two separate teachers, mm -hmm. two, mm -hmm. two teachers for each building, yeah. but separate. You said, in my teaching background has to, I guess I just want to know more. You have one room here, it's one through four, and the other room was five through eight. Yeah. You had two teachers in that building? Yes. The, the, the two age groups are there at the same time? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. What was your favorite subject? Can't help it. <laughs> Can't help it. Well, Ruth Dolby Young mm -hmm. was my first teacher. And she was young and beautiful, and the kids all loved her, and she said to us one day that, she would not be coming back the next year, that she was getting married, and she was going to marry Don Young, who was, for a period of time, the chief of police here in Plymouth, uh, way beyond my time. Mm -hmm. But anyway, she was, uh, she was exceptional. You said that Draper cared for their employees. Um, the, I'm, I'm asking questions about the recreational background did they provide, you have a community hall where you could gather, what kind of events would be there? Would they host them? Well, the big thing from the Draper side of it was, was they had their awards banquets there, and I've seen pictures that the, the hall was full of people with tables lined up. From a child's perspective, it was fun to go over there. We could play basketball. Mm -hmm. We could roller skate on, on the floor of the gymnasium, which today you'd never be able to do that. Uh, there was a pool table, uh, the t uh, educational facilities put on Christmas programs. If anybody in the community had, was having a baby, they'd do baby showers. Uh, my grandmother taught me how to play whist. They had whist parties, and I don't know why they ever let a child play, but we'd, I'd play with my grandmother, and if we won, we'd move to the next table. So, I mean, most of the things that happened when I was in BB River were really simple things, but they were re remarkable for the memories that they created. Mm -hmm. I'm going to run back to the um, schools that you have. Today we have one grade uh, for second grade, and then we have third grade and oh, fourth yeah. grade. This is a multi age, so one through four yep. are together, excuse me, and they're in the same class learning from the yep, teacher? They're in the same room. Mm -hmm. The four grades are in the same room. And if the teacher was teaching one grade, the older kids were asked to help the younger kids that were not being taught at the time. Mm -hmm. So it was um, just something was expected of us and we were glad to do it. Wow. I, just... I had long braids at the time. And there was a boy that sat behind me that loved to put my braids in the ink pot that was on the desk. <laughs> uh huh. You don't want to give the name, do you? No. Never mind. Never no. mind. <laughs> my oh gosh. We did Barbara Willette, so that's a good thing. Should we share a picture of you just for a little oh, break? Oh, sure. Yeah. All right. So the picture that we have here 
That was my high school picture. Mm -hmm. I graduated from Plymouth High School in 1955 in the old school. Okay. Yeah. And then we have a series of small, yeah. very difficult, but what we're, ho we're, go we're hoping to get a group of pictures. We're scanning mm -hmm. them now and we'll put them, uh, Andrew will infuse them within the program that you're, rece you're receiving, seeing now. Yeah. Who are the people? So, this was one of my grade school pictures. Mm -hmm. And uh, the pictures below that are of my sister and myself. Mm -hmm. My sister was 17 years older than I. 17. And my older brother was 20 years older than I. And my brother Earl was seven years older than I. So I was a spoiled baby girl. <laughs> wow. And how old were you here again? I would say I might have been maybe 12, All something right. like that. All right. We're guessing. Thank you for doing that. Thank yeah. you for doing that. I, I cannot believe sharing this Right here is what? This is a poem that was given to the Campton Historical Society about B.B. River. And um, Louise tells me that that was a man who was very well known. Mm -hmm. But I don't remember what his name was. That's, it's, it's that's, uh, yeah, it's Dudley Loffman. So many people in the audience may have yeah. heard of him. But again, the title of this is Bobbin at B.B. River. Again, an individual must have felt uh, yeah. this was important. And yeah. He oh, enjoyed yeah. writing poetry, and he yeah. put it together, history and poetry at the making. Yeah. That's kind of neat. Yeah, it That's is. That's kind of neat. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Let's continue if we can. I did that. Oh, you were talking about you enjoyed your time there. You loved the apartments, the homes that were there. But over time, they just didn't quite keep up to snuff. I think what happened is when, when Drapers left B.B. River in 1980, the first uh, factory that came in was uh, Rockwell. Rock, Rockwell? Or, I think it's Rockwell, not Rockdale. No, I uh, think you're right. Yeah, uh, and I don't know what their, what their work was that was there, but mm -hmm. in succession, the Draper Corporation, B.B. River, was sold to different companies. And in my opinion, what happened was maybe the first company was all right, maybe it wasn't, but maybe the next company thought, I'm not going to put any money in those old buildings. I'm not going to keep the, the, high, the, the roads in good condition. I'm not going to do a lot of things that Drapers did for their employees. And I can remember at one time, uh, there was talk about a union coming into B.B. River when it was Drapers. Wow. And at that time, and I still don't know a lot about unions, but I know that the whole community was split. They, some people wanted the union to come in, and some people did not want it to come in, but it was defeated. And I don't know subsequent companies what happened, but I believe the last company that was in B.B. River was a coffin uh, business. And um, that's no longer there. Can but, you guess how long that was there for, a handful of years? Uh, not too many, I don't think, mm -hmm. but I don't, I don't really know how many was there. But in my mind, each succeeding company did a little bit less for the community. And then uh, at one time, they, someone decided to sell the whole community. And I begged my husband to let me buy my house that I grew up in. And he said, <laughs> you know something, there's going to be problems there. The water system's not good and blah, blah. Long story short, Campton has repaired the water system. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a septic system in there that's to each house. So anyone who came into that property, uh, into that town and wanted to buy property, the houses are some of them are quite run down, but some of them are coming back, too. People are coming into the community and uh, buying these houses and fixing them this up. This is an example of, yeah, am yeah. I correct? I went, uh, perhaps some of you people don't know I'm a real estate agent, but I went, uh, just for my interest in B.B. River, I went to this bankruptcy sale. When I had a house listed in B.B. River two or three, maybe four years ago, uh, it sold for $90,000. This house was on the back street, and I went in, and uh, my vision was it could be repaired. You know, the floors seemed nice, and at the ceilings, I didn't go upstairs, but uh, it sold. The, the auctioneer started at 59000 and mm -hmm. I thought, oh, that's low. And uh, 
it went down the next starting point he started at 5000 and then somebody long story short it sold for $22,000 this particular house that particular house oh. three bedrooms one bathroom dining room living room kitchen and a full basement and a one car garage now, for anyone who is starting out, or for an investor, and I don't know what this person's uh, thoughts were on it, mm -hmm. but that was a bargain and a half. And I said to my associate broker, I'm awfully glad I didn't go and get the $5,000 deposit, because I probably would have been silly enough to buy the house out, <laughs> out of Love and BB River. <laughs> I already well. have a house. <laughs> <laughs> and it's called Memories. Oh, yes. The way it was. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. So, so over the decades, things have changed. You've seen this sprawling community growing together. Uh, it started to change hands from here to here. It had its day, and then you had some issues with the way things were going. What's happening there now? Well, I see people now, like this person who came to this bankruptcy sale, where can you find a place to live for $22,000, even if you have to do work to it? You know, uh, I think that eventually people will start coming in there uh, and redoing the houses. So maybe four or five that have been redone now, one of which was the house I grew up in. And I think I told you the story that I, I drove into BB River one day and I pulled up in uh, opposite my house that I used to live in and there was two men standing there. Mm -hmm. So. I thought they probably wonder what the heck I'm doing. So I unrolled the window and I said, I used to live in that house. And they said, one of the men said, well, I live in that house now. And I said, well, my mother planted that lilac bush and the orange bush out back many, many years ago, because I left there in 1955. And my mother left there in 1970 something. Uh, and she, she only left because you could not live in the house unless someone in the house worked for the Draper Corporation. And my sister decided she wanted to have her own home again. So when my sister moved, my mother had to move. So um, he said, you don't have to worry, I'll take very good care of your mother's flowers. <laughs> <laughs> Do, can we quickly find the picture of the house? Oh, yes. Way back when, that'll be fine. Oh, yes. These are just pictures that Barb has scanned to share what the community, and maybe we can put them up. They will not be visible as well as, hopefully, when we load it into the program. Yeah. But the first one that she has shows you, I'm going to steal this one from yeah. you if I can. This is the way the community was then. That's it the way is, it is now. Oops, say it again. It's the way it is now. Yeah. All right. It's a great picture, so I'm hoping that we do get a chance to scan it. But you can see all of the homes in the back that she is talking about. You can see the pond, the pond in the front. Which of the two ponds is this one? That is the larger pond. Larger pond. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, one down. And we uh, kind of fun. we used to go through behind the roughing mill to where the dam was, the BB River small dam, mm -hmm. and that's where we swam. You know, and there'd always be a mother there to make sure nobody was getting into trouble. Hmm. This is the house when Thank I lived you. in it. So this is what it was when she was a child. And this is the house that it is currently? Yes. Currently. Yeah. Yeah. And it has been bought, as she shared with you, in the story. Oh, yeah. That's neat. That is neat. Yeah. But I love what you have here. Yeah. You can see that the vines are going up on the house. The shrubbery is just crawling from the first floor to the second floor. <laughs> At the end of the house was a rose bush that was absolutely gorgeous. Okay. That my mother, my mother was really into flowers. Oh, you can yeah. see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, you yeah. surround yourself with beauty on flowers. I didn't That's inherit her green thumb, though, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, you seem to love the area very much. You've been away for decades, but yeah, it, there's yeah. something there. There is. Yeah. It was a really, really nice place to grow up in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the parents never worried about the children because there were always mothers around. And if somebody else's mother spoke to you, you had better be minding your business mm -hmm. because she would tell your parents when, when the parents got home. And the day was long there because the whistle blew at 7 o'clock, no, at 5 minutes of 7, the whistle blew to call the employees to come to work. 
at uh, 12 o'clock it blew again Fine. for the lunch hour. Five minutes of one, it blew, you better be getting back to work again. And then it was either four or five o'clock in the afternoon when the work day was done. So it was kind of a long day and not all the mothers worked. Mm -hmm. So the mothers that were home kept a half eye on all these kids that were just playing, you know. It was such a family facility. You know, the whole community felt more like a family. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were all poor, but nobody knew we were poor, you know. Um, so they worked together? The, they played together, recreated oh together? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You said something to me in one of our chats about turtles. Oh, yes. Now, I never <laughs> see the turtles, but in the logging pond, they said that there were turtles big enough to stand on. A man could stand on them. And I thought, oh, that's just horse manure. You know, it, uh, that, a turtle could not be that big. And I was down at Squam Lake one day in the upstairs of one of my friends, and I looked out the window. And here is this turtle in Squam Lake that is this big. So I no longer question whether that turtles in, in the logging pond were that big, because if they are in the lake, they probably were there too. Were these friendly turtles? I mean, oh, I don't there, know. Was there a story about them? The only story at bottom would be my brother would say, oh, I see a big, another big turtle over in the logging pond. Okay. And then okay. he would, you know, go like this. It was a good size one. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd be interested if anybody knows that history out there. Let us know. Let us know. <laughs> yeah, that mm -hmm. would be great. That would be interesting. Yeah. This is an interesting booklet that yeah. you shared with me. Yeah. Could you go there a little bit? Yeah, that was the booklet put out on the 40th anniversary of Draper's being there. And in it, it shows a lot of the people who work there. It shows um, the different buildings. There's, uh, it's a really neat book, and I don't expect mm -hmm. there's many of those around. This one my brother Earl and my sister-in-law Betty had, and she kindly let me borrow it. Um, but they were having this 40th anniversary party, and in it they honored uh, the people who had worked there 40 years, and my mother was one of them. Wow. And her name is wow. along with the other people in that book, so that's kind of special. Mm -hmm. I think the pictures in here, again, you can see some of the folks. Here we are. Vivian Gallinger. She was Gallagher. An ins Gallagher, yeah. inspector, 31 years of service. Earl Bailey, 25 years of service. But again, the complex from the air shows you how massive it truly oh, it was. was. Uh, 22,000 acres was purchased with that property. That is a lot of acres. It's a lot of acres. You had a 25th anniversary in 1951, like so many other companies. You see all the employees that are yeah. in front. Yeah. Yeah. They're a nice way of saying thank you to all of the folks. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 You know, as we, as we talk about this, this is truly a story. It is a story. Yeah. Um, Self-contained, model community. Uh, there should be something that you can do with all the material. What should be done with all the materials that we have here? Well, I've talked for years about writing a book, mm -hmm. and now I'm going into semi-retirement at 84. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this is the time that I'm going to write the book about B.B. River. It might not mean anything to many people, but for anyone who ever knew anything about B.B. River or their grandparents or any of that type thing, it should be interesting. And what I would always recommend to people who have older people in their family mm -hmm. to get their history down. More times I think uh, I should have taped my mother because she was born in 1897 and her whole life so much change from pedestrian to horseback to horseless carriages to, you know, to planes and airplanes and jet planes and space travel. Her lifetime was full of change. And I think it still happens today, and, and I would hopefully hope that people would take notice of their older people in their family and get some of their history down, because once they're gone, it's gone. It's gone. Yeah. It is gone. Yeah. I think one of the most common requests we get at the Historical Society, it happens every couple of weeks. I'll receive an email that says, can you find anything about our grandparents? They, we know that they 
were born in Plymouth, New Hampshire, yeah. and I'm working on one now, 1803. Yeah. Or was there any connection to the Civil War? Was there any connection yeah. to the Revolutionary War? Uh, we need a little bit more information, but sometimes we can dig and we can find, but otherwise it's gone. Yeah. I think that's one of the wonderful things about historical societies. I belong to four different historical societies because I love history, <laughs> is that you do get these uh, requests for information. And where would people go without the historical societies? I mean, you could mm -hmm. go get the birth certificate, but you wouldn't be able to get much more than that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so historical societies are really wonderful, I think. Uh, ours is young, there's no yeah. doubt about it. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm guessing correctly, 1974. That is a young society. Yeah. So you have to look for people to give you the information, and this is the oh, one yeah. way we've been able to do it in the last yeah. four years. But again, yours ends up in a file. The pictures are in a file, the questions are in a file. So if you forget to share this with your, or no one sees it on YouTube, or on PBTV, yeah. they still have a beginning point with us, yeah. which is good, which is good. Well, I think my children have heard so much about B.B. Rowe, they could write a book. <laughs> <laughs> because different things will, will remind me of what might have happened in B.B. Rowe. I think a book is beyond so many people. Oh. How have you started to do this so far? I, I know what my first chapter is going to be. How did I get there from here? I love it. Yeah. Absolutely love it. And that I'll go back to when my parents came from Vermont, mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. grandparents and my parents. And there were an awful lot of people in BB River who came from Vermont. And they came from the Waterville area and the Cambridge area and the Jeffersonville area. At least that's what I know more about rather than some other part of the state. Mm -hmm. And I think most of them came because they thought New Hampshire would give them a better quality of life than what they had in Vermont. And my parents had a, a farm, and they were desperate poor, I guess, because my, my grandparents talked them into coming into New Hampshire. Wow. Wow. Hmm. I'm the audience now, and they're listening to your stories. And if they know a story that connects to B.B. River, Draper, it could be people they knew that worked there at one time or add to what you have shared today. Yeah. What might you say, how can they connect to you? They can call me, they can mm. uh, email me, I'll come to them. And if they have a story that I can use in my book, I will give them the credit for it. Okay. And when a book is published, I'll give them a book. Wow. Wow, so I heard it here. That would be so important to me to get another perspective yeah. from other people. Um, the book here is going to be very helpful with the pictures. I wish there was more text in there. Yeah. But you can see over the years how it's progressed. It truly is the stories of the people who lived there, who worked there. As you said, if someone in that family did not work for the company, they could not live there. Is yeah, that accurate? That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and one of the big things that happened when I was in B.B. River was one of the very first New Hampshire lottery winners was a man that lived in B.B. River. <laughs> and he, the first thing he did was went out and bought a brand spanking new car. <laughs> and how the talk went around the town. <laughs> are we allowed to share the name? Last name was Joyce. Joyce. Yeah, and there right. are Joyce's still in the area. That's yeah. neat. Yeah. That's neat. So, yeah. Are there stories that we may have not touched upon today as I look around with the artifacts? How you came here, what school was like. I, I'm just continued to be impressed with this corporation, Draper Corporation. Oh, yeah. How they treated you, how much uh, the families when yeah. I talk about yeah. this. Uh, building a school, building a school and all the facilities you think you would need. You had a yeah. post office, administrative building, you had a grocery store. Did you ever leave? Oh, yes. Uh, people got the everyday necess necessities food-wise at the store. But in that time period, going to Plymouth on a Friday night was not only to go grocery shopping, it was a social center because people would sit on the street in their cars after they got their shopping done, and mm -hmm. other people would come by and stop to talk, and 
you go down to get groceries at five o'clock, you might leave Plymouth at nine, <laughs> you know, because it, it really was that yeah. people would come along and especially people in Plymouth that didn't get to BB if they happened to see you sitting there, but it, BB River employees would stop to talk to each other too. Oh, that's neat. And of course, I wasn't very old at that time, so that wasn't particularly interesting to me. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you a story about going to movies. Uh, Again, we didn't have a whole lot of money when I was growing up, and we'd, us, my brother and I would go out and pick up bottles on the weekend, and we'd turn them in. I think a big bottle got you five cents, and a small bottle got you two cents, and you could go to the Plymouth Theater for 12 cents, 10 cents for the ticket, and two cents for the tax, and I think popcorn was like $10, oh, $10, yeah, <laughs> 10 cents for a really big container of popcorn. And who was working there? Oh boy, I can't remember. The, I should remember the names, but was I can't. It, was it Keniston? I'm trying to think of yes, who worked upstairs. Yes, yes. Mac? Yep. Mac? Mac Keniston? Yeah, yeah. Am I right on that? Yeah, right. he was. <laughs> he was there in that time period. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. I, 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 they say the story seems so silly when you talk about that, and yet the same, it makes us smile. Oh, yeah. It makes us smile. That's what we remember about our childhood. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we didn't have West Plymouth at the time, so the main street of Plymouth, north to south, that's where it was at. Yeah. yeah. Well, when I first went back to BB River after I'd been away for a while, I was very disheartened because you could drive your car on the road and you could bury your car in the potholes. It, the roads were terrible. Uh, I went up one time and there was one of the houses where was two doors down from where I lived. In the front yard it had mattresses and old cars and just plain junk. Mm -hmm. And I went away from there feeling really kind of sick to my stomach to see that the town had deteriorated that much over the years. And then as I go back now and I see there's a house here that's being redone and a house here and my wish for that community is, even though the houses would be privately owned, that there would be the pride in their houses that there was when Draper Corporation had it. Mm -hmm. Draper Corporation had their own gardeners and they mowed all the lawns and you couldn't leave cars out in your yard, you had to put them in your garage and they had people to pick up the trash for you and uh, had their own dump. They laid out vegetable gardens called Victory Gardens during the war and everyone had a victory garden. They built a big, what we called root cellars over where the garages were so that you could store your vegetables there and uh, your canned goods and all that kind of stuff. And the garages were not close to the houses at that time, but when you went over by the logging pond, there were two long stretches of garages for people who wanted a garage. And then when you cross the railroad tracks, there was another long set of garages. And down beyond there or was where the baseball field was, where the men played baseball. And uh, oftentimes the guys would go over on their lunch hour and play pool in the community hall. Mm. There was just so much life in the community mm. at That's that time and so much pride in the community at that time. Uh, I hope that the people are setting an example that have refinished their houses, nice. you know. Yeah. And um, I would dearly love to go through my house again. Always will be my house. Mm -hmm. Did you hear but that? I would be just <laughs> to the owners today, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'd be just. I I would just think it'd be too bold to ask them. To, Maybe. To go Maybe in. they'll invite you. Well, Maybe that would be wonderful. I would be there in a flash. That has <laughs> happened in town. If you go up on Fair, Fairgrounds Road. One of the owners knew that that house had been a school uh -huh. at one time, and he invited, he and she invited people to come in for an opportunity to see what it looked like now, but also to chat about memories. Oh, yeah. What a wonderful opportunity. Oh, really? Wonderful opportunity. Really, yeah. So your vision is a beautiful vision, and it's starting to move slowly in that direction? It is. Uh, when I went up to the auction, the last time I was in BB River, Back Street had all these big holes in the road, too. Mm -hmm. When I went up to that auction about two weeks ago, the Back Street was not paved, but it was all nicely ground uh, gravel uh, and packed. Beautiful. So that Back Street is all right. But when I went around in front of the pond to go out the other way, 
again, you could bury your car in some of the holes there. So hopefully uh, some of the people coming in uh, will see what's been done and want to do the same thing to their new house. And if you could buy a house for 22000 whoo, in this market mm -hmm. especially, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. pretty amazing. Uh, it would be really, really easy. With some of the buildings that were used before, they, they're still standing, or parts of them are still standing. The schoolhouse has been torn down, and that's why it's really important if people are interested to go look at the schoolhouse in Campton. The old schoolhouse by the store, because that uh, was the exact replica, except in later years, Camden built on the back of it, mm -hmm. but the front part of it was exactly like ours. But the factories that were there then, partially, are any of those factories still there, so somebody could come in and have a small business? Well, yeah, the Ruffin Mill is there, and the Finnish Mill is there. They're both there. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know the condition of them. Uh, yeah. The Ruffin Mill looks really bad, but it was a Ruffin Mill to start with, so. <laughs> <laughs> Great name. Great name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But they, they did many different things in the Ruffin Mill, too. I just don't know what they were. Mm -hmm. But like I said earlier, it was 35 steps to make a bobbin, to make amazing. a finished bobbin. Amazing from a company that did many other things and was world famous for the other things they did uh, and only came to B.B. River because of the hardwood yeah. to make the bobbins. You think of the industries that we had here locally and mm -hmm. also in the big cities and so many of them have gone elsewhere oh, yeah. outside our country. Oh, yeah. Outside our country. Well, it was amazing mm -hmm. to me that a, a big city factory would want to come to B.B. River. But then so. when you look into why they came to B.B. River, we had all the assets they needed to be a very exactly successful company. That's the draw. Yeah, yeah. The people that we have, the resources that we had here. Oh, this has been neat. This has been fun. Is there another story that you'd like to share? I mean, you've given us a vision of what it could be like, yeah. and you need the right people to be there. Oh, yeah. But I really thank you for going, for going backwards. It's, it's a story that really needs to be told. And you've mentioned here or there, you don't know a lot about this or that, you know, everything there is to know, but amongst the community of Campton, I'm assuming others know, yeah. that can add to the puzzle that you've uh, yeah. created today and shared with our audience. Yeah. I think I shared it with my other interview about how the children made money. Uh, I would pick berries and sell them for 10 cents a quart. <laughs> And because the boarding house needed lots of potatoes, they would grow huge fields of potatoes. And then when it was harvesting time, they would uh, pay us kids 10 cents a bushel to pick up the potatoes. And in a, a couple of days, we probably could earn a couple dollars, which was a lot of money for us back then. Sure. Didn't we just say that the rent was what? Four dollars, yeah. Four dollars a week. A month. A no, month. What? No, excuse me. A week. week. Yes. So, wow. Yes. Wow. Uh, the other thing we did was when the, the bobbins were no longer suitable, like if it had a cracked head here and you couldn't put the bushings in it or put the rings on it, that was thrown away. And what the truck, uh, the draper trucks would do was if you wanted some for your house, they'd drop them at your house. But if you, no one wanted them at that time frame, then they would go to the dump. Mm -hmm. Transfer station was never heard of then. It was the dump. And they would burn them. And when they were burned down, the copper inserts would come out. And when the fire cooled, us kids would go down there, pick the, bu the bushings out. They called them bushings. And they called the rings, rings. Uh, and we could sell those for 10 cents a pound. And I read an article not too long ago that said that the Draper Corporation took very good care that the salvage people did not cheat the children. You wow. Know. What a community. Yeah. What and a community it was. Yeah. In our victory gardens, everybody after work at night would go to work in the victory gardens. And they were called victory gardens because the food that we could grow ourselves left more food for the military. And the other thing we did was we picked, uh, oh, I'm trying to think of that fluffy plant that comes out in the fall. Milkweed. Milkweed. We picked milkweed mm -hmm. f as a school project. Mm -hmm. And I had always been told uh, it was used for a different purchase, 
purpose. Uh, I was told it was to uh, work somehow with the parachutes. Well, when my, uh, my interview came out the last time, someone called me up and said, no, that was not correct. They were used for wa uh, life jackets. That fluffy material was put into life jackets, so if anyone was on a ship or something and got into the water, that would be what would be holding them up, would be a mm -hmm. project of BB River. Wow. Our, our time has come to a close. I cannot believe that this hour <laughs> went as fast as it did. Maybe we need to have an episode three. Thank you, Barbara, thank you coming, for coming again. Um, there are probably some other stories, but I think this is so rare, so unique, and so wonderful that you lived through it, and you are willing to share this with us. So please, audience, if you have stories with, for Barbara, connect with her, write them down, jot down the notes, um, try to do the best that you can to see if this is one of the best books we'll have here in the area in the next year or so to share with people. Would you like me to give my phone number? Oh, please do. I yeah. think it's fine. <clears throat> you may be inundated. Yeah. My, well, yeah, the best time to call me is at night because I am still working. Mm -hmm. uh, hope to be working for a little bit more part-time, but it's 603-279-6490. I do have an answering service on my phone. You can email me at Bob, B-A-R-B, at Pine Shores, P-I-N-E-S-H-O-R-E-S-L-L-C dot com. If you email me and you leave the S off Pine Shores, I'll never get it. So, okay. it's so we Pine want you Shores. to repeat the phone number right now, 603-279-6490. And the email. One more time because I'm very okay. slow when I'm writing. It's, it's Bob, <coughs> excuse me. Bob at Pine Shores, P I N E S H O R E S L L C dot com. And I'll be sure to get back to you quicker than you want. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. To our audience, thank you for joining us today. Um, I enjoyed it, and I'm sure the audience did as well. This is our last one for the season. Again, it's December 21st. Happy holidays to you all. We hope to start up in the spring next year, go back to our regular schedule, which is around April. We have a handful of people that are hoping the, the situation in the world that we've been given right now will be in a better place and we're able to sit down and chat the way we did today. So happy holidays, everybody. Merry Christmas and a happy new year. You've got it. Thank yeah. you for coming. Yeah.